gaining global support for media freedom. A day of action spanning the planet draws attention to Al Jazeera journalists in prison in Egypt, promoting the message, journalism is not a crime. But what is the public's perception of the profession? This is Inside Story. A global day of action is drawing attention to the dangers faced by journalists. Dozens are killed and imprisoned each year simply for doing their jobs. Reporting on stories some states don't want made public. Hello, I'm Fuli Batibo. Welcome to this special edition of Inside Story. Events are taking place throughout the world in support of media freedom. Journalists, human rights activists and supporters gathered in Sydney. Many thoughts, I'm sure, with Peter Gresser, one of the Al Jazeera staff members being held in Egypt, who is himself Australian. In Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, people held up posters bearing the phrases, journalism is not a crime and free the media. Nobel Peace Prize winner Talakul Karman here on the right joined events in Yemen. The journalist and human rights activist turned politician became the face of the Yemeni uprising in 2011 that led to a change of leadership. And in London, people gathered in Trafalgar Square with some of our journalists with their mouth taped shut and holding black balloons stamped with the now viral hashtag Free AJ Staff. They showed their solidarity for Al Jazeera's detained journalists in Egypt. Well, Al Jazeera journalists Mohamed Fami, Bahem Mohamed and Peter Gresser have now spent more than two months in prison. They're accused of having links to a terrorist organization and spreading false news. Al Jazeera rejects the charges. Another Al Jazeera journalist, Abdullah Al Shami from the network's Arabic channel, has been held since August. He has been on hunger strike for more than a month to protest against his imprisonment. Well, journalists often work in dangerous places. 75 were killed in 2013, according to Reporters Without Borders and some 211 journalists were jailed around the world. Egypt is among the worst countries for jailing journalists, and it's considered the third most dangerous country for journalists to operate in behind Iraq and Syria. And it's worth mentioning two journalists have already been killed this year, one in Iraq, the other in Ukraine. Well, let's bring in our guests to hear their thoughts on this issue. In Brussels, Ernest Sagaga, Human Rights and Communications Officer for the International Federation of Journalists. In our London studios is Tom Fenton, former senior correspondent for CBS News and author of the book Bad News, The Decline of Reporting, The Business of News and the Danger to us all. And joining us from Nottingham in the UK is Nicholas Tagurias, co-director of the Centre for Freedom of Media at Sheffield University. Gentlemen, thank you all for being on Inside Story today. If I may start with you, Ernest Sagaga, why have so many journalists been killed uh, or detained in the last decade? What factors have led to the rise in the number of attacks or violent acts against journalists? Thank you very much for the opportunity. Can I start by saying that uh, we should not always talk about journalists and, and forget about our colleagues who are helping us in doing our job, including cameramen, drivers, and fixers. Indeed. And in our account, uh, you just mentioned 75 kids last year. We only have 105 uh, kids in, in 2013. Now, to your, to your question, there are many reasons for uh, violence against journalists. There is, of course, the, 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 there are cases of armed conflicts, war, like in, uh, in Iraq uh, and Syria and Pakistan and elsewhere. But there are also uh, uh, other reasons, including the drug war in, in uh, Latin America. But there are also uh, other reasons as well, like uh, corruption and intolerance to dissent and accountability, which makes uh, many zones in the world killing fields for journalists. Right. So there are all these uh, whole range of, of issues that make uh, journalism a very, very uh, dangerous profession indeed. Uh, a general assault, you say, on journalists across the world, and it's not just in developing countries or aspiring democracies, is it, uh, Ernest? I mean, countries that prize, uh, pride themselves on being uh, democracies and respecting the rule of law have not necessarily set a good example, have they? Well, of course, uh, there isn't. We accept that journalism will never be uh, a risk free profession. And you find that in some countries which are stable, which are, as you say, ruled by uh, uh, under democratic rule, that is possible. 
But you, if you compare to countries where there is war or there is no democracy at all, that's where we are likely to find uh, more cases of killings and uh, intimidation and arrests. Hmm. Uh, Tom Fenton in London, you're, of course, a veteran journalist. And as Ernest mentioned, it's not a risk-free profession. What is it, in your view, what, what's the per public perception of our profession today? Why is it in a country like Egypt, is there the confusion today uh, between terrorism and, and journalism, in your opinion? Well, because uh, terrorism or terrorism laws are a very useful tool for controlling journalists and uh, in, imposing uh, uh, censorship. I mean, it's, it's been used uh, uh, in, in a number of countries. Uh, it's been used in the United States. It's been used in, in Britain to put pressure on uh, on uh, journalists, uh, of, of course, as uh, as has been said, uh, these journalists were simply doing journalism. They were mm -hmm. doing their job. You, know, you you cannot report a conflict uh, in, unless you contact uh, all sides of the con conflict right. and, and and try to understand you know what what they have to say. Right, and precisely, if if a journalist can be accused of terrorism, Tom, where where does that leave the public's right? Uh, to know how fine a line well, the, uh, between respecting the rule of law and respecting anti-terrorism laws and, and getting information to the public, which is more important mm -hmm. in your view? Well, I would say the public's right to know is, is, is should be unrestricted because the one of the great fundamentals of a democracy is this free information, the freedom of the press. Um, if you have the, the uh, rule by the people, and the, the people have to be kept informed. When you when you balance the uh, the t threat of terrorism against the uh, the need for a functioning uh, democracy, I, I don't think there's any equivalence. It's much more important uh, that, that full information uh, gets out, and uh, I, I I'm strongly against any restrictions whatsoever on it. And, mm. and certainly in this case in in Egypt, this is. This is an egregious case of uh, it's an it's an escalation of, uh, uh, of of the war against journalism, you might call it. Right, uh, Nicholas Sagurias, do you agree with Tom when he says that uh, it's uh, the public's right to know is more important? Um, well, perhaps I have a more nuanced view about this thing because um, you have two public goods. Uh, one is the freedom of expression, and journalistic expression is part of the freedom of expression. On the other hand, you have other important interests, the security interests of the state, the state should secure the, uh, its people, the safety of the people. Um, so um, these interests may clash. So in my view, uh, there's always a fair balance to be struck between uh, these two interests. And you have to see it on a case-by-case -case basis and to consider whether in a specific instance, uh, what is the more important interest that can justify some restrictions on the other interests? And I have to say that uh, freedom of expression is, of course, a very important interest and it's for the public uh, arena. Yeah. But all the international conventions that they have recognized uh, the right to uh, freedom of speech, um, they include certain restrictions on the basis of national security, public safety, etc. Uh, so it is not an absolute right, it's a qualified right, and it needs to be considered in relation to the other interests of the state. And I have to add another thing, which is that um, the uh, freedom of expression and the fact that the journalists are uh, holding governments into account. Mm. It's part of their professional role, uh, but it's not their constitutional role. So the constitutional role, uh, that role is played by governments that they are accountable to parliaments, there are elected governments in democratic societies, and of course you have courts that uh, they can make uh, this uh, decision. So the decision as to which interest is more important is done institutionally, mm. uh, is done mainly by the courts. And uh, the courts have a lot of, of course, problems in assessing the interest, but it's not done by uh, the journalists. Mm. 
in non-democratic societies, I think there is a big problem because they don't have these mechanisms of assessing uh, the right, because the courts cannot, cannot always be independent when it comes to that. And it is extremely worrying, though, that in Egypt, for instance, uh, in the post-Mubarak Egypt, journalists can be now considered uh, terrorists for doing their job. I, I just wanted to ask you, be before we go into you know, how we can fight this and what can be done to better protect journalists, if there are other precedents of anywhere else in the world of, of journalists being brought to justice under terrorism charges. Um, the reason, but, uh, well, as far as I know, um, um, I don't know, perhaps there may have been, but I'm not aware of mm. something. But uh, there are cases where, uh, for example, the journalists or the material they are um, holding, uh, the police has investigated them. Uh, there is a recent case from the uh, UK Supreme Court that was in 2000, February, I mean this month. 2014, the Miranda case, uh, where judges had to make uh, this kind of very fine balancing between uh, the interest, the public interest in, in relation to terrorism uh, or protection against terrorism and uh, the interest of journalists to uh, freedom of expression. Um, so um, although journalists may not have been brought uh, before courts on mm. charges of uh, supporting terrorism, etc. Um, but they have been affected because of uh, this overriding interest of protecting the state and its people. Right. Uh, uh, if I can come to you, Ernest uh, Saganga, in Brussels now, I, I wanted to ask you, are there any laws under international law to bring uh, to justice the perpetrators of attacks on journalists? Are they protected under international law, is what I'm trying to say? Yes, they are. And if you may allow me, I just want to go back a bit because we should not be confused or confusing uh, the legitimate business of government to fight terrorism, uh, which, by the way, uh, targets in unsuspecting civilians, including journalists, and the right of a journalist to report on public events. As we know, uh, terrorism is uh, an act of engaging in violence, and I don't know of any journalist who goes out to engage in that kind of behavior. That would not be a journalist, that would be not journalism. Secondly, when it comes to the accountability, Journalism is a public good, and the reason why it is a public good is because one of the roles of, the journal of journalism is exactly to hold the government to account and to inform the public about the way their public affairs are being run. So, and we were very much against the, uh, the judgment in the case of Miranda, because clearly that would impact adversary on, on, on the way that journalists go about their business. Now, coming to your question, yes, there are uh, there are legal instruments uh, which guarantee protection of journalists. If you take uh, the legal instruments on the international human rights law, uh, they also guarantee the right to, to life, they guarantee the right to safety, to physical safety, uh, to all citizens, including journalists. And the governments have got responsibility to ensure that those rights are enforced. If you also consider the humanitarian law, the international mm -hmm. humanitarian law, which is applicable to armed conflicts, journalists are also protected as civilians. Right. And again, that falls on uh, war warring factions, be they governments or armed groups, to respect the uh, independence and the life of journalists. Right. Tom, I think you, you wanted to, to jump in there. Yes, another very, very important role of, of journalists is as a watchdog, is to, to see the dangers coming down the road, uh, to alert the public to them, uh, to, to keep them informed, and to keep the government informed in, in, as well. Mm -hmm. That's extremely important, and, and that's not unconnected with the, with the war against terrorism, uh, uh, so to speak. There was, there was a lot that wasn't done in the United States mm -hmm. before 9-11 that, that could have been done that, that might have prevented the attacks on the uh, the World Trade Center and, and on the Pentagon. Uh, that's, this is one, another reason why I weigh much more, I give much more weight to the, the right of uh, f freedom of expression, right. uh, the freedom of the press. But, as, but Tom, as a journalist. To a restrictive one. Uh, Tom, a journalist always saw the voice of, of truth and masses. Well, look, we all make <laughs> mistakes. That's something else that bothers me about the charges that have been. Uh, 
placed against the Al Jazeera reporters of spreading false information. Journalism is sort of the, it's a rough draft of, uh, first draft of history. We make mistakes. Uh, to, to jail someone for, uh, uh, for an honest error uh, is going, I think, going far too, uh, much too far. Okay, well, let, let's just uh, t uh, take a pause and uh, take a, a good example of how, of how journalists have been affected. Well, the single worst attack on, on journalists happened in the Philippines. That was back in 2009. Al Jazeera's Jamila Alindogan reports uh, from Sultan Kudarat province in Mindanao. Let's take a look. The streets of Maguindanao can be dangerous for journalists like Jaynard Angeles. His hard-hitting reports often implicate those who are in power. He's had many threats against his life in this area of southern Philippines. These threats against my life only made me feel stronger. I committed myself to this that no matter what happens, I will do my job as a journalist the best way I know how. At least 29 journalists died in the Maguindanao massacre in 2009. It is the worst attack on journalists in peacetime anywhere in the world. One of the Philippines' most powerful political families, the Ampatuans, have been implicated in the attack. But years later, witnesses continue to be killed and the case remains tied up in the courts. At least 26 journalists have been killed since President Benigno Aquino took office in 2010. And despite his repeated promises to tackle this issue, no one has been convicted for these murders. And because of that, some journalists have decided to protect themselves. <laughs> Gary Fuerzas and his wife believe that arming themselves is the best defense they can have. Despite the Philippines' tradition of press freedom, journalists continue to be attacked. And Human Rights Watch says it is because of the country's failing justice system and the lack of political desire to go after the killers. Jamel Alindogan, Al Jazeera, Sultan Kadarat, Southern Philippines. Tom, Tom Fenton in London, how, how do you react to this idea of journalists carrying guns to protect themselves? I, I'm against it. I've always been against it, uh, and I've had a number of occasions in, in my long career when uh, I was with others who, uh, who who thought they had to carry arms, but I'm against it. Uh, if I can quickly raise another point, uh, there's one of the great problems facing journalists right now in some of these conflict areas is uh, self-censorship, mm. uh, and that's probably the main reason for the escalation by the Egyptian government. Uh, charging uh, the Al Jazeera journalists with uh, conspiring with, uh, with terrorists. How many journalists now are now going to continue to report in Egypt fairly, in a balanced way, to report uh, all sides of, uh, of, of the what is still an ongoing uh, conflict? Right. Uh, and we saw the same thing in the United States before the, in the run-up to the invasion of Iraq. There were a lot of journalists who were afraid to speak out. Uh, too bad they didn't. Right. Uh, Ernest Sagaga in Brussels, uh, in, in a country like Egypt today, who's more, most at risk, a, a local journalist more, so, more at risk than the foreign journalists who, co who come to cover the story? Actually, it doesn't make a difference between because both the local and the foreign are there to do to do a job. Right. We have seen, unfortunately, that in all these situations, actually the local journalists are by and large likely to face violence uh, than their fellow uh, colleagues who are come from other countries. Right. Uh, in, uh, as far as what international law, you know, what sort of protection legally is there for journalists, Nicholas in uh, um, Nottingham, you've written an interesting paper on whether, you know, violence against journalists uh, could be considered a crime against humanity. Can it be considered a crime against yes, humanity? Does international law offer any protection to journalists? Yes, it does. Um, so there are uh, things we were mentioned before. You have human rights law, you have international humanitarian law that offers protection. Um, and uh, of course, international criminal law. So I prepared a paper uh, to uh, consider whether attacks against journalists in situations of widespread or systematic attacks on the civilian population, like uh, what happens in Syria, 
uh, can be considered qualified as crimes against humanity. And I concluded that can be qualified as a crime against humanity. So, for example, an attack, uh, the murder, the killing, the torture, the kidnapping of a journalist in Syria now could qualify as a crime against humanity. Mm. But the, the, the main problem but, but for a country like in Egypt, for law, instance, that, that hasn't signed up to any international court, how do you bring a government like the one yeah. of Egypt before an international court on this issue? Yes, that's uh, very difficult. So the attacks on journalists in Egypt are uh, ordinary crimes. So it can be murder, can be kidnapping, can be um, uh, arbitrary imprisonment. Uh, but the problem is the failing system in Egypt, the failing rule of law system in Egypt. And there are no redress uh, against those crimes. So the only way you can bring uh, Egypt or any other country into, uh, there is no way of bringing Egypt or any other country into an international court. The only thing that can happen is condemnation of their practices and increasing awareness of uh, the plight of journalists in Egypt or in other states. Um, of course, Egypt is party to the um, African uh, Convention on Human Rights, etc. But uh, there can be uh, no judicial redress I in this sense. Okay, uh, I'd like to uh, just uh, give you some of the reactions we've been getting as we've seen uh, the International Day of Action has gathered a lot of support, but not everyone is a fan of the media. Lai Edayan tells us on Facebook, some journalists exaggerate, some are biased in their reporting and some hide sensitive information. I don't think that they're doing their job. Aman Duhan says Indian media is extremely corrupt. They are just an extended part of the political parties. And Numan Aryan says in Bangladesh, journalists are just a toy for our government. And we've got also David Quinn Ingen, who adds that Western media equals biased news, shallow views. Tom Fenton, I'd like you to react to that uh, last comment there. Western media equals biased views. That's the view in many countries like Egypt today, that Western media has a very biased and distorted uh, view of what's happening in the country. Well, this, this may be true. Uh, the Western media doesn't get it right all the time. And in, in fact, the, I think the Western media has uh, gotten it wrong a number of times in, in the entire uh, so-called Arab Spring. We didn't see it coming. We didn't see where it was going. Uh, it's an imperfect trade uh, journalism. But unless you're there, unless you're allowed to report, uh, you're not going to get anywhere near the truth. Uh, better, better an imperfect uh, press than, than no free press at all. Is, is it possible for a story like Egypt, for a journalist to be balanced, to talk to both sides uh, of the issue? Is it possible? Well, wait, wait a minute. Balance doesn't mean talking to both sides. Sometimes there are three or four or, or five sides, mm -hmm. and all sides don't, don't have e equal weight. But no, it's extremely difficult. If, if you don't connect with people, if you don't listen to them, if you don't actually see what they're doing uh, to get anywhere near uh, an approximation of the truth. Uh, Tom, just uh, one final point. As a journalist, from your experience, what can we do to, to, to better protect ourselves? What about our personal responsibilities? When we report on a sensitive story like Egypt, what can we do to better protect ourselves? Well. You, you, have to, you, you have to do your best to, uh, there are certain things you have to respect. Uh, for, uh, for one thing, you, you, you don't want to be a, a cause of uh, someone losing his life. Uh, you, you know that what, what you say and what you report uh, uh, has consequences. Uh, all, all, I can, all I can suggest is that you learn as much as you can about the situation talk to as many people as, as possible and, and and try to report uh, um, without your bias. We, we all have a bias. We have a national bias. It's shaped by what our governments do. Uh, try to see things as they are. It's not easy, but that's the only, uh, that's the only advice I can offer. And we'll leave it on that advice. Ernest Sagaga, Tom Fenton, and Nicholas Saguria, thank you all for being on this edition of Inside Story. And you can help the campaign to free Al Jazeera journalists by using the hashtag FreeAJStaff.
I'm Fully Batibo from me and all the team here in Doha. Thank you for watching.